It's great to be here. Can folks can you hear me? So uh, I'm going to talk about something that I've been sort of thinking about a lot on and off. Um, I don't have any great solutions, but it's sort of more of like a challenge talk, and or at least the first you know five ten minutes is um, sort of more of a challenge talk for things that I hope people will pick up. So yeah, the title is "What Do We Do When Participation?" Oh, six, sorry, my clicker might not be. Oops. Okay. Uh, when participation is um, representative or non-representative. Um, and maybe I'll just start with a little bit about who I am uh, in that I might not sort of, uh, I'm not, uh, I've always been blockchain adjacent in some sense, but never sort of really part of the community. So maybe folks here don't know me. So um, my research is at the intersection of economics and computer science and operations research. And what that means in practice is um, sort of things I've done in the past is like participatory budgeting, algorithmic pricing, um, rating systems. Today I'll talk about sort of um, a crowdsourcing system, but really what I think is um, a democratic system. And so, for example, in participatory budgeting, I think this was back in like 2016, 2017, um, sort of showed how you can um, sort of, you know, allocate money uh, uh, via sort of uh, what, what, what at that time sort of what we, I think, viewed as like a, a local quadratic funding mechanism. And that sort of uh, people can make local changes to sort of a candidate solution, and hopefully, sort of you can mimic gradient descent to converge to um, an optimal societal budget. But sort of that—that's all. Sort of a long way to say is um, I've never directly worked in blockchain type things, but sort of I've always been adjacent, and so hopefully we can take some some sort of challenges from the things I do think about a lot more and uh, apply them to sort of the things that y'all are building. And I think what sort of energizes me about the conversations I've had yesterday and today is really sort of folks here are building things and sort of just trying out mechanisms that maybe folks in my community are usually just thinking about theoretically or proving things about. Okay. Um, okay, so that, that was a long-winded introduction to myself, but so let, let's get to the problem that I want to talk about, which is um, in classic voting and social choice theory, um, like, you know, classic, like, you know, if you just think about how we've, you know, done sort of 101 on how we do majority rule, sort of the goal is almost always to correctly aggregate the preferences of those who show up, right? And, you know, clearly that's not sort of what's the problem. The problem is not everyone votes. So this is, um, this is a graph of um, a sort of the percentage, the percentage of the adult population in the United States that voted in an election, sort of voted in presidential election going back from 1789 to 2016, right? And so like, what does this graph, clearly for a long time, you know, a lot of people were um, sort of ineligible, were, were sort of oppressed and not able to vote, not given the vote, right? So sort of, you, sort of this graph shows a long, maybe a very long winding path to the U.S. becoming more of a democracy, um, you know? Especially this week might show that we're not there yet, um, but you know the sort of so clearly not every, everyone is eligible. Uh, but even amongst the eligible, not everyone votes. Sort of depending on presidential, off-cycle elections, sort of what have you. And you know this problem is everywhere, and it's especially true for like fancy mechanisms, new technologies, and so on. So for example, in grad school, when we were sort of, I was part of a lab that um, sort of. Um, uh, my advisor had built uh, sort of a participatory budgeting platform, and sort of was help, um, this platform was being used to run PB elections. I think at this point uh, we've run well over 100 elections in, in different U.S. cities. And sort of one thing that always bothered us was who are the people voting in a random off-cycle Tuesday election, um, sort of in this like new fancy mechanism, right? So like even if we prove all the theorems we want about how our mechanism is good converges for amongst those who's voting, what about those who are not voting or are not able to vote or sort of for whatever reason? And I'm going to claim is that this is something that you can't just set aside, sort of this is like actually a bad thing and sort of I hope sort of the governance protocols that y'all are building sort of treat this as a first order problem that um, sort of like if you actually want the outcome to reflect your community's will, sort of you can't just make arguments about why it works amongst those who are voting or funding or contributing money. Sort of you need to tackle this problem. 
OK, so what are various ways that um, sort of clearly this is not a neat, like, you know, I'm not the first one. To, you know, this is like a very long standing problem that a lot of people have talked about. So what are ways that we sort of traditionally tackle this problem um, in, in standard mechanisms and standard society, right? So perhaps the most sort of the most canonical way that has many different implementations is um, reweighting votes by observable characteristics. And now, you know, y'all are thinking this is crazy. We like you clearly we don't do this in like U.S. democracy, but you know we do, right? So in the U.S. House of Representatives, the seat count per state is based on the total population. It's not based on the voting population. It's not based on the number of citizens. It's not based on those who showed up at the last poll. It's it's based on population, and the reason for that is is sort of you know maybe I don't want to say the reason because you know who knows what the um, sort of, you know, I don't want to make claims about what the founders thought or, you know, I don't really care. But sort of one, one argument to defend that is sort of the claim that the people sort of spatially related to each other, so spatial neighbors, can represent sort of interests of sort of the citizens who vote can represent the interests of their spatial neighbors even if their neighbors cannot vote or do not vote. Now clearly that's not true in the case of for example, especially incarcerated populations and sort of often in rural areas and sort of are their interests being represented. But that's sort of that's the claim, right? Is we're up vote, we're upweighting the the votes of sort of citizens in proportion to sort of their, the non-citizen population. Um, you can also think about just like not re just re-voting spatially, but sort of other observables, um, gender, you know. We, we see this in various other applications. Maybe I can give some examples, right? Um, race, gender, party. So, you know, may, maybe outside of democracy, but in sort of trying to predict elections, this is what polling companies do, right? Is sort of they call a bunch of people, they know their, pop, their sample population is not representative of the full population, and they reweight by observables. Um, there's, you know, fancy ways to do this in various settings. Um, I really like this paper, um, sort of not by me, uh, Fair Algorithms for Selecting Citizen Assemblies. Sort of what they do is they're in a deliberative democracy setting where um, a lot of organizations sort of, um, you know, essentially collect groups of people to, um, to sort of like talk through issues and that, that sort of normally they write reports and uh, produce outcomes. And the goal is uh, to sort of try to capture what people would believe after sort of after like three intense days of deliberation. So not necessarily what the population believes going in, but would believe after you know potentially being educated, being exposed to each other's views and so on. And one big problem that many organizations face here is um, you know participation is again not representative. That you know you can cut it on any dimension. That the people who volunteer to participate um, are not um, sort of representative of the population they care about. And so they sort of do some nice ways to sort of select the actual participants from the volunteers such that um, sort of each individual person still has a pretty good shot of being selected, but then the overall composition of who's selected um, is representative. You know, um, there, there's um, all this work on liquid democracy where maybe one way to solve this is you just ask people to delegate their votes to other people. So you know, I don't want to vote, I can't vote, or whatever, but I, I just choose who gets to vote in my stead. Um, sort of, we, we uh, this is the stuff that, you know, I've been adjacent to, like, you know, re read some stuff about, like, decentralized societies, and sort of from what I, you know, yeah, I'm gonna, I might be wrong about what I'm about to say, but my impression is sort of there they built in ways or sort of propose various ways to do, uh, do this reweighting uh, re based on essentially how correlated you are um, w with other people in your community. Okay. And so this is all to say is there's a whole bunch of ways that, you know, people have tried that, you know, I think roughly fall under the banner of reweighting observations. And um, sort of this might be the first thing that uh, you, you should try thinking about it. I really hope that some of you sort of implement in your various, um, you know, voting, funding, 
sort of uh, governance teams. Uh, but, but I don't think this is enough. Uh, and uh, the reason why I don't think this is enough is because th there's a lot of implicit assumptions here that, you know, uh, if, if you're all on the Twitter, you know, sort of, um, th there was a back and forth, I, I didn't want to screenshot and share, but there was like a back and forth between um, some of the folks in DSOC and others of like sort of, is this, up, is this like waiting even the right thing to do? How do you find who are the right people to wait? Does it do it implicitly and so on? And so, you know, what, what do all of these existing approaches assume? It assumes that, okay, so it, it, it's good on one end in that they recognize that voting is not representative. Um, but, you know, it, they do assume that we know what representative means, right? That like sort of what, it, that we have some sense of the target population that we care to represent, uh, that, you know, we, we care that our, that our outputs correctly aggregate the preferences of. Um, they then assume that there's enough people who are like those who don't vote. That even if sort of um, not everyone shows up, the sort of the people who do show up can be weighted in a way such that um, you can mimic the true population. And perhaps the hardest part, I, I think this is the sort of the challenging part in general, is that they assume that we can meaningfully identify who those people are. Right, so like, um, and by meaningfully identify, I mean sort of like, you know, um, not just like, oh, like, you know, y'all ma match on observables, uh, race and ethnicity or so on, but we can agree that because of these, like sort of, these are the features of, um, that deserve uh, like weighting up, weighting down, and so on. And I think this was what some of the sort of, a lot of the discussions about sort of hard, co I, I think this is where a lot of the difficulty in coding up any governance mechanism that does this will be, right? So like um, clearly in the, um, in the US, we face a lot of challenges with this, with sort of like gerrymandering is a problem with exactly this, right? It's sort of like it, it's a way political parties are sort of see deciding who to up, up weight um, in order to maximize their own outcomes. Yeah, and then there's the sort of, there, 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 that there's some mechanism that you could actually ma make those people's opinions more important. And um, sort of w what I want to sort of say is the challenge is that I don't think these, these assumptions often hold. In a lot of governance mechanisms that you might be doing, sort of, um, sort of, especially the third one, but sort of I think all of them are challenging. And um, I don't know what the solutions are, and I hope sort of maybe someone uh, smarter than me will sort of try to think through what are the right governance mechanisms when these assumptions don't hold. Um, and so like here are some like fun, um, maybe the opposite of fun um, examples. So uh, just as an illustration. So um, in election polling, you know, many of you might have read that, um, you know, in, in 2016, the major polls were off by, you know, you know, certainly on the binary outcome of the U.S. presidential election, but sort of in like continuous sense, we're off by like I think around three-ish, three-ish points on what the overall vote would be. Um, and sort of like why did that happen is because sort of they were already doing this waiting, right? So like what they what they they did was you know they called a bunch of people or online polls, got a bunch of responses, new observable characteristics of those who responded, so primarily. Um, race, gender, um, sometimes party identification, depending on the state. And then they just tried to rebalance the people who answered with what they guessed would be the voting population. And the big problem in 2016 was educate was sort of, they didn't reweight by education. And it turns out that education was correlated with who answered the polls. So in that sense, who showed up. And um, it was also correlated with sort of people's preferences for in the election. And so that was a setting in which reweighting sort of did not work. Okay, so 2020 came around, um, all the pollsters sort of recognized that, that failure and started weighting by education. Turns out in 2020 that wasn't enough because sort of even, um, even after controlling for education, there was still this residual sort of people who supported Trump were less likely to answer the polls. And so all the re sort of, that was another failure of like identifying sort of 
who amongst the answering population represents the true population you cared about. And so, you know, I think this is, I just wanted as an example of this might be iterative. If you're implementing these rating, re rating techniques, you might want to be iterative, but that's still, you know, um, you, you can't always fight the last election. Right, and then, you know, similar things. And that, like, you know, in standard voting, sort of deciding who to update might be problematic. Okay, so that was, you know, um, you know, th these are all things that um, I've been thinking about at a high level. What I want to spend maybe the last 10 minutes that I have is um, sort of giving an example of a system that um, sort of all of you, like none of you might even think of as a democratic system, but sort of one that just to show, I think, of how common these problems are of unrepresentative participation. So not just applying to those of you building governance mechanisms, but also sort of all sorts of crowdfunding, um, sort of crowdsourcing, sort of just like learning mechanisms. And like how um, I think some of these problems show up in quite subtle ways. And so, um, and th uh, sort of I, I want to do this sort of as in, because this was really my entry way to start thinking about what might be context specific solutions to some of the challenges I talked about here. And so what's the context? The context is um, equity crowdsource, uh, is, is resident crowdsourcing. So for those of you who are New York, and so this is joint work uh, with my PhD student, Jia Lu. Uh, and so what's the background? So for those of you in New York, you might know about the 311 system, which is a number that you can just call to the complaint to the government about things, right? So you call 911 because you need an ambulance right now, you call 311 because there's a pothole or a tree falling down on a power line, graffiti, noise complaint, sort of complaints to the local government about things. And like, this is huge system. So New York receives about 2.7 million requests last year. Um, and it's like easy to be cynical that you're complaining to the local government and nothing happens, but there's entire government agencies organized around resolving these complaints. So for example, um, we're partnering with the Parks Department in New York City. Um, the Parks Department is responsible for maintaining about 700,000 street trees. So these are trees lining the streets of New York, not counting trees in parks. So there's about 700,000 trees, even if you don't count Central Park and all like the many of the other amazing parks we have. This is virtually impossible for the agency to monitor in any real time sense from like employees, right? No one's being funded by that large amount. And so what they rely on is people calling in to complain about problems f about their trees. And so what's like the pipeline that happened? Um, there's, you know, an incident occurred. At some point, hopefully, and this is what sort of I'm gonna view as participation here, is at some point, hopefully, so someone is gonna call in a report, right? Is gonna say that, you know, hey, this tree, has a broken branch, is about to hit a power line, or about to fall on a person, or whatever. And um, the subunit of the Parks Department we're working with receives about um, 85,000 reports a year. Uh, and then, you know, this is an intensive process. So uh, more than half the time, almost two thirds of the time, the agency sends out a forester to look at the tree in question and to determine, like, what's going on. And about half the time they do that, they actually schedule a maintenance crew to come in and fix the issue, right? So this is a really capital intensive sort of labor intensive process. And like, you know, this is how allocation of government services happens. And what we try to understand here is reporting behavior, right? So like in what circumstances does an incident actually generate a report? How long does it take? And why is that important is because this is exactly the question of participation, right? So if, if one neighborhood systematically underreports compared to another neighborhood, even given the sort of, even given sort of what the, you know, if, if that those neighborhoods are facing similar issues, then the, 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 area, the neighborhood that reports more is gonna systematically get better government services, right? This, this is, so like this is a this is a system where we're already doing the weighting by geography, right? It's like I never have to report 
if like I have like a neighbor who's amazing who like walks around every day and like sends in all the reports they want, right? But uh, what we're worried about here is even that's not enough, that they're just neighborhoods that systematically underreport. And you can tell all sorts of causal stories why that might be true. Um, you know, things about trust in government due to historical services, um, access to technology, time, um, educate, right? You, you can tell all sorts of sto stories about why some neighborhoods might be, you know, the squeaky wheel that gets the grease and others aren't. And so we wanted to, first of all, measure this because measuring this is, and um, I think in your applications too, measuring this is the first sort of step of resolving it, right? Is we can sort of do, and this is what we're working on now, is think about all sorts of fun downstream interventions to correct for underreporting, but you have to know what they are first. And so what's the statistical challenge? The statistical challenge in our problem is how do we distinguish between underreporting and that neighborhood truly having fewer problems, right? So by definition, we don't observe reports. We don't observe data on missing reports, right? The entire reason these systems exist is because we don't know the ground truth. And so just like this in your systems, um, I, I sort of, it, it might be easy to say, and you know, we say this in, in American politics all this time, that you know, those who don't vote are like maybe apathetic or don't actually care about the outcomes. But that's almost never true, right? It's sort of, is the question that they don't care, that they're truly facing fewer problems, or is it just some other reporting hurdle or voting hurdle for participation? Um, and so, you know, I, I'm not sure I need to walk through this example, but very quickly, you know, two neighborhoods exist, one with 10 incidents, the other with five, and the one with five reports all of their incidents, and the other one reports just half. Um, from like, you know, the eyes of the system, these two neighborhoods look exactly the same, right? We only observe five reports for five incident, reported incidents per neighborhood. How do we statistically distinguish these things? And this is, I think, a benchmark problem um, that's uh, fundamental in a lot of settings, even outside of participation. So uh, this is sort of um, perhaps the hardest thing when sort of trying to do stati statistical analyses for inequitable policing. A lot of really good economics work is around getting around this problem um, when, you know, um, sort of showing um, sort of that policing is um, inequitable. Um, and m maybe I'm going to skip through the methods a little bit just because sort of maybe that's not what y'all are interested in. Uh, but, you know, maybe as a few sentence summary, uh, the classic thing to do, the classic approach is to go out and walk the streets and get a snapshot uncensored view, right? So like go out and try to figure out some alternate way to get ground truth and then just compare the number of reports to this like true, true ground truth that you might have. Um, you often don't have this, right? It's often, especially in this setting, it's like really expensive, you know, I'm just a poor professor, hopefully someone will fund and I don't have time to hire a bunch of people to like walk around the streets. And so the statistics question we wanted to answer here was were there are ways to measure this underreporting without actually going out and walking the streets? Um, I'm gonna skip how we did it just because I only have a few minutes left. Um, I was always planning on skipping this. There's fun math, you know, happy to talk about this offline for those of you who like fun math. Um, but sort of the, sort of maybe the upshot is what we ended up measuring was on average, how long does it take for the first report to come in after the incident happens, right? So what's the delay between reporting and um, between the incident happening and the report? And the claim is that like sort of, if that differs by neighborhood, that's gonna be a bad thing. Okay, so I'm gonna skip the methods and go through um, sort of the results. Um, and may maybe the first result um, is just like g the good news, which is that the system is mostly efficient. That things that are hazardous get reported faster. Things that are maybe less dangerous, like roots, cracking sidewalks, thing, you know, things maybe over overgrown things that need to be pruned, like things, things that are less hazardous get reported slower. 
So this is all good news. Um, it's also a verification of the method. Um, but then the bad news, which is on the same order that hazardous and less hazardous things are di differentiated, um, we have different, vastly different reporting rates by neighborhood, even after conditioning out incident characteristics. Right? So for those of you familiar with New York, so, so, so here in this map, the darker, um, the darker areas are where we have lower reporting rates, and the li lighter areas are where we have um, higher reporting rates. Um, and for whatever reason, sort of the, the Columbia area and a little bit north of it was just, regardless of whatever robustness we did, always came out as the highest reporting rates. OK, anyway. Um, sort of what we found is that reporting rates are super variable by neighborhood, even conditional on incident characteristics. And you know, the difference um, you know, in, in the highest reporting rate neighborhoods, you might observe a report three times faster than you observe in, a in, in another neighborhood, um, in sort of the slowest reporting neighborhoods. And you know, I'm not going to show the regressions, but those of you familiar with New York are not going to be sort of, I don't need to tell you that sort of the colors on this map correlate with basically any socioeconomic thing you care about, um, right? Sort of education, race, income, um, sort of population density, certainly. But um, yeah, so, so like this is a bad thing, right? There's this sort of, it took a lot of work, but sort of in the system, we were able to identify in what ways um, participation was not representative. And um, sort of this was just contextualizing some of these things and just saying that in Manhattan, on average, we're seeing about two times faster than on average in Queens. Um, yeah, so that was, I think, my sort of, the reason I went through this work is sort of, it took us a lot of effort to, so even in a system that seems perfect for representation, in the sense that it doesn't require individual representation, all it required was like some notion of groups. We had you know, a very natural notion of the group, right? Like spatial neighbors, um, and that was reasonable. Um, and even here, sort of like, and like this was almost the best case scenario for I think participation being representative. But you know, it wasn't. It dramatically isn't because you know who uses like if I ask who who here has used the three one one system, my guess is like maybe three of you, and that person has used it a hundred times, and like sort of no one else has used it even once. It was like is my guess, right? So, like you know, what can we do about this? This is what we're actively working on now, and you know I, you know in general I don't think there's easy answers. And so I'm going to end with just asking you, in your, in your work, in your governance work, who is the community whose opinions you care about? Whose voices are you missing? Can you add them um, to your system? If you can't, are there ways to identify and upweight similar voices? Probably not. And if not, is voting as governance even a good mechanism? That's all I had. <laughs>